Merry Christmas to all of you watching wherever you are and welcome to our Christmas Eve service. This year our Christmas Eve service is going to be a little different than in years past, primarily because no one is here. Although we can't be together in body tonight, we can, be, we can join together in spirit with millions of Christians around the world as we celebrate the holy night when Christ was born. Our goal this evening is simply to dedicate this hour to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just like the wise men and the shepherds came 2,000 years ago, we want to come tonight and worship the newborn king. So that's what we're going to do. We have a special service planned for you this evening. Matt Williamson is going to come. He's going to read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. Kim Diggs has recorded a beautiful instrumental piece for us. She's going to play What Child Is This? It's going to be beautiful. You're going to really enjoy it. I've prepared a special Christmas Eve message from God's Word. And then at the end, we have a very special video for you to watch. I'm going to tell you more about that when I introduce the video, but you're just going to love it. It's wonderful. Our celebration of Advent concludes tonight on Christmas Eve. One of the ways that we celebrate Advent is with our Advent wreath here. And tonight we're lighting the final candle. We're lighting the Christ candle in the middle of the wreath. And the candle is white, which symbolizes the holiness and the purity of Christ. And in lighting the Christ candle, we are reminded that He is the light of the world and that He brought His light into the world on that first Christmas when He was born in Bethlehem. And we recall the words of John chapter 1, verse 5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen? Amen. And now Melissa and I are going to read from the book of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, and then she's going to light the Christ candle for us. You ready? I'm ready. Go ahead. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there, there will be no end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the, Lord, the, zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas from Melissa and Eric. Merry we Christmas. love you. I've been extended the privilege of reading for you the account of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. This account has been provided to us by Dr. Luke, which he based on what the actual eyewitnesses to these events reported to him. Please follow along with me in your Bible if you like. This is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Suddenly, 
an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement that had been told them by the angel about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things the shepherds said. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. This is the word of God to us. I hope all of you have a wonderful, happy, and Merry Christmas. We just thank Matt for, for sharing the Christmas story with us, reading the, the beautiful living word of God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with joy and thanksgiving. We know the great, great good news that a Savior has been born. We know that you so loved us that you sent your Son that we might have life. He came as a, as a tiny infant, born to humble people, found in a manger. There was no room in the inn. Lord, help us to know the, the beauty and the depth of your love and the love of Christ our Savior, one God eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for the great news of the birth of Jesus. We thank you for the life of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that, that there can only be Christmas because there's Easter, and Easter could not be if there wasn't Christmas. We thank you for the birth of our Savior. We thank you that we can come together in your name and you are at work among us through the presence of Christ in us. So in this Christmas season, we rejoice and we say hallelujah to the King of kings and the Lord of lords who became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. May that thought and that lifestyle abide with us today and always. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Before we begin, let's pray. Bow with me and pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention now to your word, we pray that your spirit would come and teach us. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes and open our minds to hear your word clearly tonight. Father, I pray that you would help me to speak your word boldly and clearly and accurately. And Father, we pray that you would help us to hear and understand your word so that we can do what it says. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I also want to mention that before I get started, that there are some sermon notes available on the website right under the video. There's a little box there you can click on with some PDF sermon notes. You can print those out and use those to follow along with the sermon if you'd like. A few years ago, it was the middle of the Christmas rush at the New Orleans airport. And passengers were standing in line, and one of, them, one of them asked the man at the counter, why is there mistletoe hanging over the baggage counter? And the man said, it's there so that you can kiss your luggage goodbye. According to AAA, at least 34 million fewer Americans are traveling this holiday season. Three quarters of the U.S. population are planning to stay home for Christmas this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that means there won't be as much traffic on the roads. Airports will be less crowded and fewer people will be kissing their luggage goodbye this year. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the holidays will be any less stressful, does it? In the passage that Melissa and I just read for you from Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet Isaiah was writing seven centuries before the first Christmas. Seven centuries. And war clouds were on the horizon. There was no blue sky anywhere in sight. The Assyrians would soon conquer Israel. And after that, they would threaten Judah as well. Later on, Babylon would overthrow Assyria, and they would enslave Judah for 70 years. In, uh, in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet describes the condition of the people before the Messiah came, before the child is born, before the son is given, as it says in verse 6. And in verse 2, the people are walking in darkness. They're living in a land of deep darkness, it says. In verse 4, they can feel the yoke of their burden, the staff across their shoulders, and the rod of the oppressor. In verse 5, they've known the boot of the tramping warrior and the garment rolled in blood. Their nation is in chaos and distress and spiritual confusion. Sounds a lot like America in 2020, doesn't it? This has been a really hard year, hasn't it? And the stress doesn't go away just because it's the holiday season. Stress doesn't take a holiday. In fact, stress usually goes up during the Christmas holidays, doesn't it? People are lonely during the holidays. So the number of suicides increases. Depression rates go up. And some of us could be facing our first Christmas without someone that we love. Others are facing personal struggles or difficult issues in other areas of our lives. And of course, events in the world today aren't helping our stress level either, are they? We, have this, we still have this pandemic going on and all the anxiety and all the uncertainty that goes along with that. And we have a new president and all the anxiety and all the uncertainty that goes along with that too. These Christmas holidays can be hard days, can't they? But tonight on this Christmas Eve, I know one thing for sure. I know that God is still on the throne of this world. Amen? He's still on His throne. And if for some reason you're struggling to believe that today because you don't see God's hand at work in your life, then I want to prove it to you. But actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let the Apostle Paul prove it to you. Tonight, Paul's going to help you. He's going to reassure you that God is still on His throne. He's still in control of our world, and He's still in control of your life as well, okay? Please open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Our passage for tonight is Galatians 4.4, 4, just one verse tonight, Galatians 4.4. 4. And the title of my sermon is The Fullness of Time, and that title comes from our verse, because Paul says in verse 4 that in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. And what that means is that Christmas is no accident. It's no accident. God didn't send His Son on, to, on a sudden impulse. He didn't do it on the spur of the moment. The birth of Christ in Bethlehem fulfilled plans that God had made before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time. And so this evening, as we look at Galatians 4.4, we're going to talk about two things. First, we'll talk about how God prepared the world for the birth of His Son, how He did that. And second, we'll talk about why God prepared the world for Christmas, why He did that. And then we'll see what the, why, what the how and the why mean for our souls on this Christmas Eve. So that's my sermon outline. I want you to listen now as I'm going to read Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 4 to 7 of Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, 
born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. May God bless the reading of his word. Paul is saying several things in verse 4, but I want to focus on the first part of that verse where he says, in the, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. What is Paul saying there? Well, he's basically saying that God set a time and date, right? He's saying that God set a time and date, that God marked on the calendar up in heaven the exact time and the precise moment for the incarnation when Jesus would come down and take on flesh and be born of a woman. <clears throat> in order for God to do that, in order for him to set that time, he has to be what? He has to be sovereign, right? He has to be in control of, every, of, the, of the events of history. And we know that he is, right? We know that he's in control, right? We talked about that in our study of Ecclesiastes recently. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says this. It says, To everything there is a seed and a time to every purpose under heaven. In other words, God is sovereign over all things, and he has an appointed time for everything, including an appointed time for the birth of his son. The Bible says that before time began, God appointed a time for the birth of Christ. And he also pointed a time for his death, right? Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And as finite human beings, we struggle with that last sentence, don't we? We struggle, what does that mean to say that something happened before the foundation of the world? We have trouble with that. We struggle with anything that's infinite, don't we? Our minds can't comprehend eternity because we're trapped in time. For us, things happen one day at a time, one hour at a time, even one moment at a time. But God's not like that. God is outside of time. There's no past or future with God. All things are present with Him. There's no yesterday or tomorrow for Him. Everything is today. Everything is today. We know that because of His name, don't we? He's not the great I was. He's not the great I will be. He's the great I am. Present tense. My point is that all things are happening now before God. He looks upon all things as being present. And so he sees everything from, beginning, from the beginning of time all the way to the end, all at one time. Okay, but the, the question for us tonight is not how God sees time. The question is, how did the fullness of time come? How did God prepare the world for Christmas? We're going to look at three ways in which God did that, three ways. Now, he did a lot more than three things, okay, but we're, we are limited on time, so we're going to stop at three tonight. God prepared the world culturally, politically, and spiritually for the birth of Jesus. He prepared the world culturally, politically, and spiritually. Number one, he prepared the world culturally. And here we start with Alexander the Great, whose father Philip conquered all of the Greek world. And after Philip was assassinated, Alexander went out to conquer the rest of the world. And the city of Athens was the cultural capital of the world at that time. And so as Alexander went out, he carried the Greek culture with him. Greek architecture and Greek philosophy, and most importantly, the Greek language. And it didn't take long. In a short period of time, the Greek culture was established throughout the civilized world. And the result was a, univer result was a universal language, a universal language. In the first century, Koine or common Greek was spoken by just about everyone, from one end of the Roman Empire to all the way to the other. And that meant that all the books of the New Testament could be written in a language that everyone could read. So, for example, when Paul wrote a letter to the church at Rome, he wrote it in Greek. He didn't write it in Italian, he wrote it in Greek. And in the, in the book of Revelation, when John wrote seven letters to churches that were clear on the other side of the empire, he wrote those letters in Greek also. If you wrote those letters now, if you wrote the New Testament now, First and Second Corinthians and First and Second Thessalonians could still be in Greek, but Galatians and Ephesians would have to be in Turkish, and Romans would have to be in Italian. And my point is that when the fullness of time came, the entire civilized world spoke Greek. So there was no language barrier to hinder the spread of the gospel across the world. God prepared the world for his son culturally, but that's not all he did. Number two, he prepared the world politically as well, politically. And here we're talking about the Roman Empire. At that time, Europe and the Middle East were basically under one government, and you had what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman Peace which meant that you had great political and economic stability across the region. 
And you had the ability to travel freely and safely throughout the whole empire. You could go from Great Britain all the way to India if you wanted to. And you could do so on the magnificent roads that the Romans had built. And then, of course, no matter where you went, people could, people could talk to each other because everyone was speaking Greek, as we said before. My point is that when the fullness of time came, there's not just a universal language. There's also universal peace and roads that allowed the gospel to be taken to the world. So God prepared the world culturally and politically, but that's not all he did. He also prepared the world spiritually. Spiritually. And here we begin with the Babylonian exile, with the great sorrow that overwhelmed the people of Israel in their captivity. But out of their captivity came three good things, three good things. Number one, the first one is that the Jews finally gave up idolatry. Okay, they returned to monotheism, to worshiping one God. After the exile, the Jews had many other sins and failures, including rejecting their Messiah. But they finally learned their lesson on idolatry. It only took them about a thousand years to do that, but they finally learned their lesson, that lesson. The second good thing that happened is that after Israel's over, the Old Testament was completed. The Old Testament was completed. Ezra, the priest, along with others who came back from Babylon, gathered together the Old Testament scriptures and they assembled them in a completed form. Now, why was that important? Why did the Old Testament need to be completed before Jesus came? Well, listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 5, verse 39. He says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, he says. They needed the Old Testament because it's all about Jesus, right? It testifies about him. It points us to him. That's why it was needed. The third good thing that happened is that after the exile, you had the birth of the Jewish synagogue. Before that time, everyone had to travel to Jerusalem to worship and to offer sacrifices. But now, everywhere that the Jews were scattered, they built synagogues. And that's where they gathered to worship every week and to study God's Word, just like we do now here at this church. In Acts chapter 15, we have the record of the first church council in Jerusalem. And James, the brother of Jesus, is the presiding member of that council. And James says this, he says in Acts 15, 21, he says, For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, in that context, James is encouraging the Gentiles to respect their Jewish brothers and sisters. That's what he's saying. But my point is this, that everywhere there's a synagogue, you had people reading the Old Testament. You had them reading the books of Moses. And so as a result, you had people everywhere who learned about the coming Messiah. And that was all, about God, all part of God's preparation. Little did God's people realize, right? Little did they realize that when, they, when their nation was destroyed and then when they were taken away into exile, little, little did they realize that God was preparing the world for the coming of His Son and for the spreading of the gospel throughout the world, across the world, across the entire world, to the ends of the earth. And little do we realize sometimes that God is working in the tragedies and the sorrows of our lives. He's working in all things for our good and for His glory, Romans 8, 28, right? A good example of that is the death of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. It says, And they buried Stephen, and they made great lamentation over him. There was great sorrow over the death of Stephen. But then it says, On that day a great persecution arose against the church, and they were all scattered. And then it says, Those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Preaching the word. My point is that because of Stephen's death, the, world, the whole world was evangelized in the first century. The known world was evangelized in the first century. God worked through that great sorrow in order to accomplish His purposes for His glory. And God hasn't changed, has He? Today in the 21st century, He's still working through the sorrows in your life and in my life to accomplish His purposes for His glory. Amen. Now in preparing the world actually for Christmas, God did not stop with the Jews. Historians say that at that time there was a spiritual hunger throughout the world, throughout the entire world. Because Greek philosophers had led the society to the point of intellectual frustration. And the Roman culture had sunk to the lowest levels in terms of morality. There was no sense of universal truth or of right and wrong. Sounds a lot like 2020, doesn't it? And so this universal hunger for truth opened hearts across the world and made them ready to hear the good news of God's grace when it came. 
Having done all of that, God still wasn't finished with his preparations. Because according to Micah chapter 5, verse 2 that we looked at last week, where was the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, right? But there's a problem because Mary and Joseph live in Nazareth, which is 80 miles away. And so God still had to get this couple to Bethlehem in time for the baby to be born. And so we have Luke chapter 2, verse 1, don't we? In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. God prompted Caesar to take a census for the purpose of collecting taxes. And the, his decree required everyone in the Roman Empire to return to their ancestral home, to the city or the village where, they, where their family originated. And so millions of people traveled across the entire Roman Empire to their hometowns to register. Also that one pregnant teenage girl could bring her unborn, unborn child to Bethlehem. And so we see that God spent centuries preparing the world for the coming of His Son. He spent centuries doing that. Hundreds of years. A universal language, universal peace, a completed Old Testament, spiritual hunger, all those things. And then when the fullness of time came, at God's perfect time, He sent forth His Son. The Creator entered His creation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 says that Jesus made the universe. Colossians 1.16 says, By Him all things were created. In other words, the baby in the manger was the creator of the universe. Think about that. A newborn baby created the mother who gave him birth. He created, the, he created the manger in which he was laid and the shepherds who came to see him. He created the wise men who came to worship him and the star that, that guided them. He created all those things. Have I convinced you yet? Or should I say, has Paul convinced you yet? That the one who created this world, the one who prepared this world for the birth of his son, is still sitting on the throne of this world? Do you believe that on this Christmas Eve? This is part of a letter that I received this week from our missionary friend, Naomi Aguirre. I'm hoping she's going to come see us in January. She's back in the States, and we're hopeful that she can come visit it with us next month. But she says, I'm still a work in progress, and I'm so joyful for how God has worked in me this year. Yes, it's been different, and changes have been waiting around every corner, but I don't need to be in control. I don't need to know what will happen three hours from now. What I do need is to trust God. He's in control, and He knows what will happen. She's got the attitude that all of us need to have, doesn't she? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12 says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? My old pastor in Dallas would read that verse, and then he'd say, Now what's your problem, right? The point being that whatever your problem is, it's not too big for God to handle. You just need to trust Him. So we've looked at how God prepared the world for Christmas. Now let's talk about why. Why did God go to such great lengths to prepare the world for Christmas, for the birth of His Son? Well, He did it, he did it in order to give us the greatest Christmas gifts that you and I could ever enjoy, ever imagine. Paul describes four gifts in these verses, four blessings of our salvation in Christ. And gift number one is, the, is that we have freedom from bondage because of Christmas. We have freedom from bondage because of Christmas. In verse 5, Paul gives two reasons why God sent forth His Son. He says, first He did it so that He might redeem those who were under the law. Now the Greek word for redeem literally means to buy something out of the marketplace, to take something out of the marketplace. And it was used specifically in reference to buying a slave's freedom. Buying a slave's freedom. And so Paul's basically saying here that we were all once slaves, right? We were slaves to sin. We were condemned to eternal separation from God. In other words, we, all, we were all in need of redemption. All of us needed redemption. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. And Jesus came and He kept the law perfectly. He lived a perfect life. And then He bought our freedom. He bought our freedom. He paid the ransom price for our sin by shedding His blood on the cross. And because Christ has redeemed us, we are no longer in bondage to sin or to the law. And so to be redeemed then is to be free, forgiven, holy, justified, adopted, and reconciled. Let me say that again. To be redeemed is to be free, forgiven, holy, justified, adopted, and reconciled. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 
And we are, all, we are all of those things, not because of anything that we've done, right? It's all because of what Christ has done. It's because of Christmas that all those things are true in our lives. It's because of Christmas. Gift number two, because of Christmas we have a Father in Heaven. A Father in Heaven. Reason number two why God sent forth His Son is said, so that we might be adopted as sons in verse 5. Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're a believer, you're no longer a slave. You're now a son. You've been adopted into God's family. You're now His child, and He's your heavenly Father. And that's the story of Christmas, isn't it? I gave you this quote a couple of weeks ago. C.S. Lewis says, the son, of, the son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. 18 million children in the United States will go to sleep tonight in homes where there's no earthly father. There's no father at home for them. And that's tragic. But the good news is that no one has to go to sleep tonight without a heavenly father, do we? No one has to do that. You may have a difficult relationship with your earthly father. You may have been rejected or abandoned by your earthly father. But your heavenly father loves you without condition, unconditionally, without exception, and without end. He loves you without end. Because once you become the child of God, you will forever be the child of God. Because of Christmas, we have a Father in heaven. And gift number three is that because of Christmas, we have a family on earth. We have a family on earth. Look at Galatians 3.27. It says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Paul's not talking about water baptism there. He's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that happens at conversion, right? And through spirit baptism, we are made part of the body of Christ, which is the church, which is our true family, as we're going to talk about in just a second. It's our true family. And Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is oneness in the body of Christ. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And in this day and age of political division and racial tension in our country, we can say there's neither Republican nor Democrat in the body of Christ. There's neither black nor white. There's unity and there's community in the body of Christ instead. Why is that? Because we share a spiritual bond that's closer than any physical bond we could possibly have. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We all have the same Father in heaven, and so we're all part of the same family. And Jesus talks about that in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse 31. Jesus is speaking to a crowd. It says, Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is saying that his true family are not those who are related to him physically, right? It's those who are related to him spiritually. His disciples are his true family there. And then in Mark chapter 10, he takes it a step further. Look at Mark chapter 10, <coughs> verse 29. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. That's pretty good, huh? That's one of the greatest promises in all the New Testament for believers. You get a hundred times as much now Plus, you get eternal life in the age to come. That's a good deal, isn't it? It's a good deal. But how is that even possible? Well, it's possible because of the church, right? It's possible because of the church. What he means is that whatever we give up for his sake will be more than made up for by our true family in the church. In other words, our adoption into God's family more than compensates us if we're rejected by our earthly family, or even if we're reje rejected by society in general. doesn't matter. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way. He said, 
One house gone, but a hundred doors are opened. One brother in the flesh lost, but a hundred brothers in the spirit gained, whose love is deeper and whose kinship is profounder. Amen? And many of us in this church can say that that's been our experience, can't we? That's been our experience here. We can testify how God has blessed us a hundredfold through our church family. In fact, in our recent Thanksgiving service, we had so many people who said that, so many people who said how thankful they were and how God has blessed them abundantly through this church family. But some of you, some of you can't say that because some of you aren't experiencing all the blessings that come from being part of a church family. And that's because this promise is a really great promise, but there's a catch to it. There's a catch. Jesus offers a hundred times as much now, but only if you're part of a fellowship of believers, only if you're part of a community of faith. In other words, if you want the hundredfold blessing, you have to be involved in a local church. You have to be involved in a local church to get it. If you choose not to be involved, you're missing out on the blessing. You're missing out. And so if I'm describing you right now, then I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you to make 2021 the year that you get more involved in this church. Make this coming year the year that you get fully engaged in the fellowship here. Fully engaged. Don't miss out on the hundredfold blessing that God wants to pour out on you. Don't miss out on that, okay? Don't do that. So because of Christmas, we have, a, we have freedom from bondage. We have a Father in heaven. We have a family on earth. And gift number four is that we have a future in glory. A future in glory. Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul basically says the same thing. And look at Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. So what does it mean to be an heir of God? What's our inheritance? What is that? Well, we get all the riches of God's grace, right? We get His mercy and His love. We get His presence and His peace. We get all of those things. We inherit a relationship with Him now and forevermore. And, we, and, and we, also get, we, also, we also get to be fellow heirs with Christ, it says, which means we have the same inheritance that Christ has, which is everything, right? Which is everything that God has. Christ receives and so do we. <clears throat> All these things are ours in the glorious future that awaits us in heaven. Amen? All because God sent forth His Son to be born on Christmas Day. All because He prepared the world. He prepared he prepared the, the language, the scriptures, the peace, the roads, the spiritual climate. He prepared everything. And all because He's still on His throne today. Those are God's Christmas gifts for each one of us tonight. But like all gifts, these have to be opened. They have to be received. And if you've never done that before, then I invite you to open His gifts for you this Christmas. Do it this Christmas. Receive His free gift of salvation and eternal life. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Put your trust in His death on the cross to pay for your sins. And if you'll do that, then by the power and the grace of God, you'll have freedom from bondage, a Father in heaven, a family on earth, and a future in glory. Amen? And if you've already done that, if you're already free, if your future in glory is already assured, then give thanks to God on this Christmas Eve for the unspeakable gift of His Son. Amen? If He's already your Father, then, then whatever your problem is tonight, trust Him with it. Because whatever it is, it's not too big for Him to handle. Trust Him with it. And if we're already your family, then I invite you to come and join us every Sunday for a family meeting next year. And I invite you to pray for our church family, right? Because the family that prays together stays together. I invite you to get more involved and to spend some quality time with the family. Come and be part of the family business as we work for our Father, as we go out to share the gospel and to make disciples. Remember that this church is your true family and nothing's more important than family. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, on this Christmas Eve, we thank you for giving us the Christmas gift of your Son. 
Father, we thank you for redeeming us. We thank you for adopting us as your children. We thank you for being our Heavenly Father who loves us unconditionally. And Father, we thank you for the glorious future that you prepared for us in heaven with you for all of eternity. And Father, we pray that you would finish the work that you started in us. Father, we ask you to increase the family resemblance by making us more like your son. Help us, Father, to be the church that you've called us to be in these days. Help us this Christmas to go and share the gospel, Father, to go and tell others about the newborn king. Help us to go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And help us this Christmas, Father, to shine your light and to share your love with everyone that we meet. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I told you that we have a special video for you to watch now. This is the African Children's Choir singing Joy to the World. And I found this video the other day and it really touched my heart. They're so joyful and their joy is contagious. And I called them and they were gracious enough to let me use their video tonight. And so we put a link to the choir's website on our homepage. I'd invite you to click on that link and check them out if you get a chance, if you have time. It'd be worth your time to do that. And so I hope you enjoy watching these kids. I hope they bring a smile to your face. Merry Christmas to all and thank you for watching. Good night. Oh, God.